Hello and welcome to this tutorial on statistical significance testing. My name is Brian Miller. I'll be guiding you through this. First and foremost, we'll have to learn a few key terms. A population is the group from which data are collected or a sample is selected. The population encompasses the entire group for which the data are alleged to apply. In fact, we hope to make generalizations about the population. And the population could be anything as broad and wide as all men in the world or as narrow as all middle-aged, grumpy, bald-headed professors or um, all people over six feet tall or uh, those students enrolled in a particular junior high school. A sample is an individual or a group that's selected from a population from whom data are collected. So we want to collect information about samples to make um, generalizations to a population. Since we can't possibly measure all men who live in the world, all three and a half billion of them, can't probably measure all grumpy, bald-headed uh, professors, or are unlikely to be able to measure all students in a particular junior high, we would select a sample from each of those groups in, uh, to which we would hope to make generalizations. Now, of course, the larger the sample is, the more closely its parameters um, actually express population para uh, statistics. I'm sorry, let me read that. The more closely its sample statistics more closely approximate population parameters. All right, now descriptive statistics. These describe the characteristics of a given sample or a population. And these statistics are only meant to describe the characteristics of those from whom the data were collected. So we might calculate the mean or the average of a sample. So the mean of all men in the world's height might be five foot seven. Um, or the mean of, uh, oh, I don't know, some personality trait for all bald-headed middle-aged professors, or the mean um, test score for all students in a particular junior high. Now, we also have other descriptive statistics, like the standard deviation, which actually just describes how widely the other members of a sample are distributed around the mean of a sample. So when the standard deviation is really big, it means that there's wide dispersion. And yes, we can calculate a mean, but there are members of the sample who deviate greatly from that mean. And other descriptive statistics include things like uh, the median or the mode, the median being, of course, that number in the sample for which half of the sample are less than and half are higher than. And then the mode is the most common uh, score on any particular uh, measure within a sample. Now, the gist of the whole thing here is uh, inferential statistics. Uh, this is where we're using sample data to make inferences about a population. Because again, we can't usually measure every member of a population. So we want to make uh, or draw random samples from a population and make inferences about the population. That's the whole gist of statistical significance testing. Now, NHST stands for Null Hypothesis Significance Testing. And we'll go over in some greater detail um, the difference between a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis and things like that. So without further ado, we'll move on. Chance or probability of error. There is a chance probability that an event will occur simply due to random variations in the characteristics of a sample of a given size that is selected randomly from a population. So when making inferences from a sample to a population, as in inferential statistics, there is always some possibility that the sample that was selected from the population does not accurately represent the population. One of the biggest culprits there would be sample size. This is where the concepts of chance, probability, and error come into play. Error in this context is random sampling error and results from differences between the characteristics of a sample and the characteristics of a much larger population. 
Error can be caused by any random fluctuation or variability involved in the process of selecting random samples from the population. When we randomly select two samples of the same size from the same population, we are still likely to find differences between these samples, again, because no sample is a particular perfect representation of the population. So this notion of sampling error is critical in understanding NHST, or again, Null Hypothesis Significance Testing. As the size of the sample gets larger and larger and larger, it more closely approximates the size of the population, and it becomes more and more likely that any descriptive statistic of the sample, for example, the mean, becomes closer and closer to the mean of the population. Picture for a minute a big bag of diamond-encrusted ping pong balls with numbers on them embedded with rubies. This could be the entire population of all diamond-encrusted ping pong balls with number-laden rubies or rubies said about or embedded as numbers. The entire population of these things is in this bag before us. And if we draw out three of them, and let's say there are, I don't know, 30 of them in the bag, and we draw out three or four or five, we would likely find that the mean of those three, four, or five drawn from that bag would be close, but not real close, to the actual mean of the numbers embedded with rubies in the whole population. Now, as we increase our sample size to, say, 10 ping pong balls, and we look at those numbers embedded in rubies, and we say, these, the sample mean of these 10 numbers is now a little bit more likely to be close to the mean of the population. Now, let's just make it ludicrous. Let's say, again, there are, let's say there are 30 of these ping pong balls in the bag, and we draw 29 of them. The mean of those 29 is going to be so incredibly close to the mean of 30 that we can make really strong, valid inferences about the mean of the 30 from the mean of the 29. Now, it's a ludicrous example because nobody would draw a sample of 29 from a population of 30, but just to illustrate it again, if we only drew three from the bag, we might get three ping pong balls that had really low numbers. And if those numbers ranged from one to 10, and let's say we grabbed the only ping pong ball in the bag that had a one, and the only two ping pong balls in the bag that had a two on them, then we would find that our mean is like 1.33. But the mean of the population might be five if those ping pong balls range from one to nine. So 1.33 sample mean does not compare very favorably, nor does it represent very accurately the mean of the population, which in this crazy made up example would be five. Okay, let's move on to something just a little bit different. Walkup's first laws of statistics. Law number one, everything correlates with everything especially when the same individual defines the variables to be correlated. So this is particularly true in the social and behavioral sciences, where if we were measuring job attitudes like job satisfaction and organizational commitment and intention to turn over and perceived organizational support and all of those sorts of things, we'd find that we would probably have a lot of stuff that's kind of mildly correlated with each other. Now, it's a little bit different in the biomedical or the uh, physical sciences, but typically we find that if we have a large enough sample, just about everything is correlated with just about everything else, at least a little bit. Law number two though, it won't help very much to find a strong correlation between two variables that you don't understand well. This is where the role of theory should come in in guiding your research, in explaining your hypotheses. There must be some sort of a sound theoretical rationale for why two variables are related or why one group should have a higher or a lower or simply a different score on a variable than some other group. So here we're talking about correlational and experimental designs. Now, law number three, unless you can think of some logical reason why two variables should be connected as cause and effect, it doesn't help much to find a correlation between them. Now, the inferences that we can make about causality depend upon really three things. Um, are the two variables related, right? Does one temporally precede the other? That is, does one precede the other in time? 
And the third one is, does any third variable explain the relationship between the two variables? That's the most difficult one to rule out. Even in a well-designed uh, uh, experiment, it's really almost impossible to rule out the fact that some third variable affected the relationship between an IV, an independent variable, and a dependent variable. So here's an example. In Columbus, Ohio, the mean monthly rainfall correlates very nicely with the number of letters in the names of the month. Can we say that rain causes names of months? No. Can we say that names of months causes rain? No. Now they're correlated, but there's really no sound theoretical rationale for why they should be. So this is just an aberration that we just find all over the world. Okay, moving on. We now know the importance of understanding why there should be some sound theoretical rationale for an hypothesis. Let's discuss hypotheses in general. So an hypothesis is some unproven proposition that tentatively explains certain facts or phenomenon. Hypotheses make inferences about populations. Now, in statistics, technically, we test whether there is no effect, no difference, or no whatever, and we call that the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a statement about the status quo. It suggests that no difference exists. Our goal in most scientific endeavors, however, is to reject the null. The key word there is most. Sometimes, as in biology or medicine, we might want to actually find no effect, no difference, or no whatever. We might want there to be no horrible side effect of a medication, or we might want there to be no difference in the effects of different diets on an organism. But most of the time, we're looking for differences or an effect, like one medication working better than another, or one diet assisting in the health of an organism better than another diet. However, we seldom write or state the hypothesis, even though the, the null hypothesis, even though that is what is always being tested, whether we want the null to be true or not. We always state an alternative hypothesis that indicates that some difference exists. For example, we might state that there is a non-zero relationship between intelligence and job performance. That is, that the correlation between intelligence and job performance is not equal to zero. It's positive, we might hypothesize. Or we might hypothesize that one medication will indeed work better than another. Okay, let's explore this a little bit more deeply. An hypothesis establishes a rule that will be used to decide whether or not a null hypothesis should be rejected. That is, that there is no difference in the height of men and women, say, for example. A null hypothesis, H sub zero, is the hypothesis that always suggests that there will be no effect in the population. The alternative hypothesis, H sub A, or H sub one, as it's sometimes referred to, is an alternative to the null hypothesis and claims that there is an effect in the population. Now, there are two basic types of alternative hypotheses that can be made. A two-tailed alternative hypothesis does not speculate that a sample is less than or greater than the population, just that it differs. It does not speculate that the efficacy of one medicine is worse or better than another medicine, just that they differ, for example. So a two-tailed alternative hypothesis claiming that the population mean will not equal to zero, and that mean of zero being the effect of zero, no difference in essence, could be denoted as mu is not equal to zero using the uh, the lowercase mu there for uh, the Greek letter. Uh, it's a, a population parameter. Okay, a one-tailed alternative hypothesis is a directional hypothesis claiming that one value will indeed be greater. A one-tailed alternative hypothesis claims that the population mean will be less than the sample mean and would be denoted as, say, uh, mu is greater than zero. Uh, if we were looking at the hypothesis that there is a positive relationship between intelligence and job performance, 
we would hypothesize that R, lowercase r for spear, for uh, Pearson uh, product moment correlation, lowercase r is greater than zero. Uh, we would could hypothesize that medication um, one uh, effectiveness is less than medication two, or that the difference between them is greater than zero. There is some difference, and those would be all different forms of alternative hypotheses. Now, I've mentioned two-tailed and one-tailed test. Let's take a look at a diagram differentiating both of those. First, the two-tailed test. Here's the prototypical standard normal distribution. The mean, median, and mode are all at the same. They're all right here in the middle, right about there. All right. Now, in a two-tailed test with an acceptable level of type 1 risk, and we'll go over that in a minute, that is that an effect exists but that we fail to find it, the alpha level, that is the uh, area of rejection of the curve, is set to 0 0.05. That indicates that if the value of our effect in our sample is at one extreme or the other, then it is significantly different from zero at P less than 0.05. This P value indicates that we can be 95% sure that it is indeed not zero. So P values and confidence levels are really quite similar. Again, take a look here. We're making a speculation about the mean. And if we find that our mean value is far away from the, this value here in the middle, if it's way down here in the, in the tail, then we would reject the null hypothesis, or sometimes referred to as erroneously accepting the alternative, although we don't test alternative hypotheses, we test null hypotheses. So if we reject the null, we're saying that we're, it's a double negative. We're rejecting the fact that there's no difference. So there is a difference. So the value is so far down here or so far over here that it is statistically significantly different from the expected value here. Again, there's no directionality implied in a two-tailed test. We're simply saying that there is a difference or that the value is different. We don't know if it's way different low or way different high, but it's different. And if it's so different from the mean or from the expected value, then we can say that um, it is statistically significantly different. And we're gonna explore that term, that terminology there in some greater detail in subsequent slides. But let's take a quick look at a one-tailed test. Here we have some directionality implied. We suggest that perhaps not only is the effect different from zero, that is, it's either strongly negative or strongly positive, but the effect is going to be positive. Okay, so we have directionality. We're no longer saying it's just not zero. We're saying it's positive. And if, in fact, it ends up as negative, if it ends up way down in the little tail area down here to the left, then the hypothesis is technically not supported because we hypothesized it was positive. If we find that our sample effect is very, 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 very positive, way down here in this tail, then we can say that it is significant at P less than 0.05, or that we are 95% confident that it is not zero. Notice that the area under the extreme right tail is bigger on this graph than on the other graph. This is because there is no area under the left tail of this graph. In essence, this tail is twice as big as the previous slide's tail, and everything not filled in with red, that is everything to the left of the, and including this far right tail area, is just not a big enough effect. Not big enough to say with any certainty that it's actually not really zero in the population. It has to be really big to say with certainty that in effect, it is not zero and it is positive. Now I mentioned type one error. Let's take a closer look at that as well as type two error. So 
Before deciding whether to reject or retain the null hypothesis of no effect in the population, you must decide how willing you are to reject the null hypothesis when it is actually true. In other words, when deciding that an effect in the sample represents a genuine phenomenon in the population, you must conclude that the result was not just due to some random sampling error. We can never be certain that a result is not due to random sampling error, so when we reject the null hypothesis, we may actually be wrong. In the social sciences, we are usually willing to live with an error rate of 5%. So we set an alpha level of 0.05. If the p-value is smaller than that alpha level, the null hypothesis is rejected. We'll take a look at that on the next slide, but let's explore this diagram for a minute. Here we're saying the null, if the null is true, if it is true, there is no difference in means between these two samples, to use an experimental design sort of a example. If, if, if in the population there is no difference in the mean between these two groups, the control and treatment group, and we accept the null in our hypothesis testing, then we made it in a, correct, a correct diagnosis with no error. Now, if the null is false, there is some difference between the control and the treatment group, and we reject the null, we find, no, we find a difference then we've not made another correct diagnosis and we have no error. Up here in the far right quadrant, here the null is true. There's no difference between the control group and the treatment group. However, we've rejected the null. We've found a difference. This is what's called a type 1 error. And we want to make adjustments to our calculations so that we minimize type 1 error. And as I mentioned, in the social behavioral sciences, we typically will allow up to 5% of error. In essence, we're saying that if the null is true and we reject the null, we want to make sure that we're doing that correctly 95% of the time. Now, another type of error is called beta. And beta is when the null, says, null is false. That is, there is a difference between a control group and a treatment group. But in our experiment, we accept the null. We find no difference. We've made another type of error. This type of error is not quite as grievous. Okay? So think of beta error as letting a guilty man go free. And type 1 or alpha as um, executing an innocent man. Here in the Western world, we are very keen to have fair trials, and occasionally we are willing to allow an innocent person go free because we want to minimize the risk of condemning an innocent man. I'm sorry, I may have missed that. We want to minimize the risk of letting a guilty man go free. And we want to minimize the risk of, I got that wrong again, I'm so sorry. <laughs> type 2 error is letting a guilty man go free. Sorry. Okay. Um, and type 1 error is hanging an innocent man or condemning an innocent man. And we want to make so few hangings of innocent people um, that we want, that we're allowed to, uh, we allow some guilty people to go free. So alpha and beta are kind of related, and we won't get into all that, but it has to do with statistical power. Okay, moving on. I promise to get it clear from here on out. Now, two statistical significance. So now we've come to a few slides specifically on statistical significance. What we're really talking about is the determination of whether the null hypothesis is true or not. That is, is there an effect that is significantly different from zero or is the null actually true? In fact, we would like to state with at least 95% confidence that the effect we discovered in our sample is not due to chance or error alone. So we set this allowable error rate at 5%, which we call alpha, and we state that the probability of our results being a, a result of the chance characteristics of the sample should be less than 0.05, or p less than 0.05, the probability less than 0.05. Stated somewhat differently, 
and perhaps even more correctly, our p-value of less than 0.05 and our confidence level or confidence intervals of 95% suggest that 95% of other samples truly randomly drawn from the exact same population would have very similar results. So if we draw a sample from the population, run some analysis, and find results that are different from zero, then we can be very, very, very confident that almost all of the other samples drawn from that sample population would have very nearly the same results. Okay, moving on. So to be clear, statistical significance is the probability, that is P or a P value, the probability that the result that arises in this sample is from chance alone and does not truly represent the population. In other words, there is a very, very small probability or risk that this effect observed in the sample is an anomaly and that, in fact, the population parameter is actually zero. For example, suppose we gather data on household income and home values for a random sample of people in a randomly selected county in a randomly selected state. Now, one would expect a moderately positive correlation, but suppose in our sample that the correlation between these two variables turns out to be extremely low, like, like say, R equals 0.10 with a p-value of 0.40, which is certainly much higher than the standard p-value cutoff of p less than 0.05. So our sample statistic is not likely to be representative of the population. In fact, there's a 40%, remember p equals 0.40, there's a 40% chance that the sample statistic arose by chance alone and that in the population, the correlation is actually equal to zero. Now this might arise because the households chosen for our survey might have happened to be over-educated yuppies from California and Dallas that live in inexpensive so-called tiny homes like the other cool kids. Typically, the well-educated people earn more money and buy more expensive homes. However, in our sample, it might be incredibly small, say 100 yuppies out of a million households in the county. Our sample correlation value might not be accurate at all. What if our sample was 100,000 and the correlation was still 0.10? In that case, our correlation of 0.10 might be closer to the true population value because the sample is much closer in size and characteristics to the population. In that case, a super large sample will probably yield a correlation very close to the true population parameter. However, we don't know the population parameter. So what is the probability that our correlation based on 100 persons is the result of sampling error? What about our correlation based on 100,000 households? Now, by sampling error, we mean errors in the sample, which usually arise because the sample is not truly random or it's just simply too small. In this case, the smallness of the sample of 100 yuppies suggests that we may have just surveyed a particular oddball yuppie neighborhood. And our sample is not at all representative of the population. Thus, our correlation is way off, and our p-value is way, way bigger than 0.05. If it's less than 0.05, we're okay with that level of risk. Remember, it's the risk that our sample statistic is not similar to our population parameter. So, less than a 5% chance of error is okay, but anything more than that is not okay. That is, it is not statistically significant from the population parameter if P is greater than or equal to 0.05. In other words, if our sample correlation is 0.10 with a P value of less than 0.05, we can say that there's a 95% chance that our sample correlation of 
is truly not zero in the population. That is, in the population, it might be very, very close to 0 0.10, but it is almost completely unlikely that it is zero. So, to determine statistical significance, we must compare the size of the effect to some measure of random sampling error, which is usually the so-called standard error. Now, the calculation of the standard error is another tutorial entirely, but let's move on. So here's the big problem. Because measures of statistical significance rely on the standard error, and the standard error is greatly influenced by sample size, then large samples often produce statistically significant results, even for very, very small effects. For example, in a sample of 5 million observations, a correlation of only 0.01 could be statistically significantly different from zero. Remember that there is a standard error associated with every statistical text, test. There is the standard error of the mean, standard error of the estimate in multiple regression, etc., etc., etc. Each statistic is divided by the appropriate standard error so small standard errors in the denominator tend to push the statistical test value higher and higher and higher. That is, further and further and further away from zero. So, the best way to ensure a small standard error is to have a large sample. And a small standard error tends to make the fraction that comprises the statistical test larger and larger and larger and thus further and further away from zero. The further away from zero we are, the less likely that our sample stat is simply not representative of the population. For example, a correlation of say 0 0.80 would have to have a really large standard error based upon a really small sample size to not actually be 0 0.80 in the population. If the sample is small, then 0 0.80 in the sample might actually truly be only 0 0.00 or zero in the population. So here's another example. Suppose we find a sample mean of 105 on some measure, intelligence, whatever you want, okay? And we know that the population mean is 100. And if the standard deviation is 15, Okay, sample mean 105, population mean 100. For some strange reason, we mysteriously know the population mean. Remember, if we know the population parameters, we don't have to do sample statistics. We don't have to make inferences from a sample to a population because we know the population. But bear with me, okay? So again, suppose we find a sample mean of 105 and a population mean is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. So we can compute a t-test to compare 105 to 100 and see if they are statistically significantly different. If they are not statistically significantly different, then the true difference is zero, not five, 105 minus 100, not five, it's actually zero. So in a sample of 25, the t-test value is actually 1.67. So the p-value is somewhere between 0.10 and 0.20. But if the sample has 1,600 subjects looking at the exact same difference score of 5, then in that case, t is not equal to 1.67. t is equal to 13.33. And the p-value is less than 0.0001. That's a 1.0001 in 10,000 chance that the sample mean of 105 is the result of sampling error or the chance characteristics of a sample. It's a 1 in 10,000 chance that the difference is actually zero. That is a very small probability. So let's move on. So here's somewhat of a remedy 
to small samples with big effects or to large samples with small effects or comparing effects across studies, the effect in one study versus the effect in another. We should report the effect size and then make a statement about the practical significance of the effect. The statistical significance is an objective fact. The practical significance is a subjective assertion. So effect size statistics minimize the impact of sample size. Basically, when calculating effect sizes, we remove the impact of the standard error, which as we know from the previous slide is heavily impacted by sample size. Then the effect is expressed in terms of standard deviation units instead of the original metric, IQ points, Likert response points, what have you. If we know the effect size, then we can make statements about the practical significance of the effect. A classic example is the number of lives saved by ingesting an aspirin each day. In a super duper large sample, the p-value was significant, that is less than 0.05, but the correlation between aspirin consumption and heart health was almost zero because of the large sample size, which led to a small standard error. However, when we translate the statistical effect of barely above 0.00 into the number of lives saved by taking one aspirin a day, the effect was then quite meaningful. Because of this finding, aspirin is now a big part of the treatment for heart disease because it's cheap, relatively harmless, and saves lives. Even if it's just a few lives, and it's not, it's many lives, then the practical significance is huge. The statistical significance suggests that it's almost zero, but the practical significance suggests the very opposite. Now the D statistic or Cohen's D as it's officially referred to is a measure of the difference between means for two groups. It's commonly used in experiments. As D approaches one, the effect is quite large. A D statistic of one would indicate that, say, the control group mean and the treatment group mean in the experiment are one pooled standard deviation apart. A pooled standard deviation is an average standard deviation. Sometimes the standard deviation in one group is different than it is in another group, so we use a sample size weighted average standard deviation. Okay, let me say that again. Sample size weighted average standard deviation known as a pooled standard deviation. In other words, if a sample of 200 has a standard deviation of 15 and a sample of 20 has a standard deviation of 25, you don't just average 15 and 25, you weight each standard deviation by the sample size of 200 for one and 20 for another. Okay, the use of standard deviation units puts this difference between the two groups on an interpretable metric. For example, if we measured the difference in height between men and women, the difference would be expressed in inches or centimeters. If we measured attitudes towards the color pink, we might find differences between men and women, but the differences there would be in Likert points since we would most likely measure attitudes with a one to five or a one to seven Likert response scale. Now, if we wanted to see if the difference in height was bigger or smaller than the difference in attitude toward pink, we can't compare inches to Likert points. We can, however, compare standard deviation units between height by gender and attitude by gender. So a small difference would be when the difference is less than 0.25 standard deviation units. That is, D is less than 0.25. A moderately sized difference is when D is between 0.25 and 0.75. And a large effect is when the number of standard deviation units between differences in height and differences in attitude is above 0.75 SD or D greater than 
So Cohen's D is a universally recognized uh, measure of effect size when comparing differently measured comparisons. In this example, we're comparing height and Likert points. You cannot compare apples to oranges. You have to convert them into standard deviation differences, and then you can compare them. Well, let's move on. Okay, that's all, folks. There's my email address and my office phone number. If you call my office, I will immediately be sent an email attachment with your voicemail. So use it if you want. Thanks.